All right, good morning, Valley View. We good today? It's good to, good to see you today on this, uh, this uh, week leading up to uh, our Resurrection Sunday where we celebrate Easter and celebrate the resurrected uh, King of the universe, Jesus Christ. So we're really glad that you're, you're here today. And uh, we've been going through this sermon series called Resurrect. And uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about this lady, a uh, Samaritan woman at the well from John chapter 4 and how she moved from being empty inside to being full after she met Jesus. Uh, last week, we talked about a guy named Nicodemus who was a religious leader, uh, had a lot of things together, so it seemed, um, but came to Jesus, had some questions. They didn't even have to ask the questions. Jesus saw right through that religious right exterior and right into his heart and told him some things that moved him from being an enemy of God to being a friend of God. And maybe you've experienced some of those things. Maybe that's why you're here today. Maybe you've got some questions about what in the world is this thing? Why am I even here? Or somebody drugged me here today and, and here I am. But one way or another, here you are today and, and we're talking about resurrect. Uh, today we're going to be in John chapter 8. We're going to be in John chapter 8, uh, verse 1. We're going to be talking about uh, this idea of being moved from slave to free. From slave to free. So I was, I was thinking back, uh, my, my first ministry was in a, a small town uh, in, uh, in Missouri, and uh, there's, a, there's a gentleman there that, that came to our church, and uh, he sat on the front, in the front right row towards the front with his wife and his two uh, high school age boys. I was a youth pastor at the time, and, and they were kids in my youth ministry. Funny kids, <laughs> funny kids, and they, I loved them to death. They were there at everything. The wife was there at everything, but Randy... He wasn't so much into this church thing a whole lot. I mean, that was for the wife and kids. You know, I mean, you know, he would come to just make her happy, right? You know, just make her, you know, I, I love her, but, you know, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, it's, it's not for me. That, that's for them. But he was there most often. That was about all he would do. He'd come and sit and get up and leave. Randy was a, was a prominent member, though, in, in that community and uh, had a pretty good business that he ran and was pretty successful. Uh, a lot of people utilized his services and, and, uh, uh, in that area. He, he's a florist, and uh, if you needed some good flowers, you went to this particular place uh, for weddings, funerals, uh, Valentine's Day, whatever the case may be. Um, Randy was also a, a golf coach, a volunteer golf, co golf coach for the high school uh, golf team. And, uh, and, and Randy loved that. He was a great golfer, and that was his passion. And so he found a way to volunteer uh, and do this. Well, one time, Randy was uh, on his way to, uh, to, this, to a, a, a tournament match. I don't know. What, I'm sorry. I'm not a golfer. I don't know what it is. A bunch of games. I don't know. <laughs> he was there, and uh, all of a sudden... Randy gets accosted by a bunch of police officers who put him in handcuffs on the golf course in front of all these other high school boys uh, who are out there at this, this tournament, and they drag him back to a police car and take him to the police station. Turns out, Randy had a little secret that not a lot of people knew about. Randy was enslaved uh, to marijuana. You know, it's not, a, not that big of a deal, right? Not, not that big of a deal, right? And turns out that uh, as uh, the bus driver, as everybody got off the bus, and uh, the bus driver was just kind of walking around, cleaning up, picking up some things uh, in the bus, bus, picking up trash and everything, he found something that he didn't really want to find and knew who was sitting in that seat. So Randy ended up in jail, golf coach of the high school boys team is in jail. And it's all over the local news. What an embarrassing moment. It was a horrible moment for Randy and for Randy's kids and for Randy's wife and friends and family and his business as well. Have you ever been caught? Have you ever, have you ever been caught in something? 
I mean, we're all sinners. I mean, I hope that's why you, you I hope you know that's why we're here. In case you're kind of new to this thing here at church, we don't come here because we think we got it all together. There may be some that do, but they're wrong, okay? If that's you, you better get, 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 on, the, get on the program here, okay? Uh, but you've probably been caught, caught in the act with something. And what do you do in that moment? And what do you do when you have been so good, quote unquote good, at living in this sin and making this sin over time where we've made these little decisions one at a time, one decision here, one decision here, and we start beginning to believe the lie that the serpent told Adam and Eve in the garden. Did God really say God's holding out something on you. He doesn't want you to not be happy. And so one decision at a time, we start making these decisions. And then all of a sudden, all of it just catches up to us. All of the years of our professional sinning and being okay, and apparently it's not that big of a deal. God's not doing anything yet. And then all of a sudden, we're caught. John 8, verse 1, says this. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives. This is where he kind of camped out a lot and hung out with some of his disciples. But early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. At the temple, remember that. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and he taught them. People loved to hear the words of Jesus. He taught like, people, like somebody that they had never heard before. And they're like, they want to be a part of this. They want to see, see this guy. They want to hear what he has to say. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and he taught them. And as he was speaking in the temple, as he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. Yikes. They put her in front of the crowd. Oh, oh, oh. time out, time out. <laughs> Wait a second. What if, okay, here we are at church. What if, what if that happened here? Right, I mean, the, the, this, this scandalous moment where this woman, the, 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 the religious guys kind of had this like patrol going or something. I don't know what wasn't the case. They get this woman and they come dragging her in. They throw her in front of Jesus and in front of everybody else. I mean, she's caught. She's caught in the act. The very ones, this, this, this educated religious right, they're the ones that bring this woman in. They're the ones who are supposed to have it all together and that people looked up to, or at least felt like they could never, everybody looked at them and thought, I could never be as good as these guys. They got it all together. That's, they're the ones that like this, this churchy stuff or whatever. They're the ones that bring this woman in and throw her in front of everybody. How, how would you feel if you were this woman? I mean, imagine this. How would you feel? Here she is standing in the midst of this murderous mob of people in the temple of God, in the church, all right? And she's exposed, heart pounding, palms sweaty. She may not make it through these next few moments. There's judgment here. There's entrapment here. There's plotting that's happened here to get to this moment. This woman is being a pawn in somebody's game to try to trap Jesus. Somebody has used this woman's enslavement to needs and desires, to just enslavement to sin. Somebody, the religious people, capitalized on this moment and on this woman's weakness and decided to use it against her to trap Jesus. Their anger towards Jesus, their frustration, their jealousy, their hatred towards Jesus led them to this moment, the religious people, to this moment. Have you ever been caught in the act? When your sin finally catches up, those seemingly innocent conversations turn into flirts, turn to longer conversations, turn to other things. Maybe it was just the social drinking every once in a while with some friends, just innocently starting out, you know, and then all of a sudden now you find yourself, you can't settle down at night anymore without this. 
And slowly, 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 it's coming back. Sin always has a way of resurrecting if you're not careful. <laughs> it's going to come back. What do you do when you're caught in that act? What do you do when you work hard all day at a stressful job, the kids are loud, the bills are numerous, and there's not enough money, and the bills are there, and your wife, she's bugging you, and then you decide that you've got to make a point of reminding her who's really in charge here, and it catches up with you, and you're staring at this woman that you love that you just beat. Have you ever been caught? And folks, let me tell you something. Sometimes it's better to be caught than to be condemned. Sometimes maybe this is God's gracious way of saying, wake up, wake up. This woman's put in front of this crowd. Some people wondered about her life, perhaps. Some people suspected maybe something was up. Now they know. <laughs> now they know. She, perhaps she's made sin a, a way of life for her. We don't know exactly if she was a prostitute or not. I, we, don't, we don't know necessarily her whole story. But we know this. This is a scandalous moment in front of all these religious people in the temple. Mothers are scurrying to try to hide the eyes of their kids. You know, oh, come on, come on, let's get out, let's get out of here. This is kind of weird, okay? She's trapped. Her sinful decisions and potentially the decisions of others in her life have gotten her trapped and enslaved at this moment now. But make no mistake, it's not just her whose sins are being revealed here, right? It's not just her. A little bit at a time, the curtain is opening up to these religious men who think they've got it all together and they're about to be exposed here as well, too. Verse 4. Teacher, they said to Jesus. <laughs> a little snarky with that. A little like, hey, you know, okay. all right, teacher. <laughs> okay. They say to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says that we've got to stone her. What do you say? <laughs> oh, a little bit of a trap here. All right, they're trying to trap Jesus. Yeah, they're, they're capitalizing on this woman's sin and, and mistakes, whatever the case may be in her life. They're trying to capitalize on that because they want to trip Jesus up because they can't stand Jesus right now and the popularity that he has and the things that, they, that he says. Let me ask you a question. Who don't you see in this story? Where's he at? Where, where's, where's the guy? Where's the guy at? We, we don't know. Where is he? Did, did he escape? I, I, I don't know. Or was he a part of some kind of a scheme to trap this lady and ultimately trap Jesus? If, if these religious guys were so like staunch on like obeying every bit of the law, the Old Testament, um, they would have known that the law in the Old Testament also says that both parties were to be stoned. Not just her. Him too. <laughs> but sometimes we want to take the little things that we want to make ourselves look okay. Maybe sometimes there's things that we're hiding, we point our finger over here. I don't know, just, this, just a thought. These men weren't as committed to obeying that law as they led on to believe. If so, they would have brought this guy in as well. These men are using this woman to trap Jesus. They're using this woman. Their, their religious fervor, what they thought was religious fervor about obeying the Old Testament law and the law of Moses, uh, it didn't translate into caring for this woman's soul. It was so important to them to, to justice to be done, unless that justice has to do with me. So they, they create this dilemma for Jesus in this situation, right? Okay, you got to remember that this is a Jewish, very religious culture who are uh, under the oppression of a foreign government, Rome. So Rome had their laws, and they also let the Jewish nation kind of have some of their laws too, but Rome's always superseded the Jewish nation's laws. And so in this situation, what's happening here is that uh, with these religious guys, they brought this woman to Jesus 
It's this fact that if Jesus said that, well, no, she shouldn't be stoned to death, then he would then be open up to a charge of not obeying the Jewish law. So the Jews would be like, well, he, you can't listen to him because, you know, what he says, he doesn't obey Moses' law, so we can't pay attention to him. That's one part of the dilemma. <laughs> but if he said that she could be stoned in this situation, I mean, clearly... She's caught in the act. So um, if he says, yeah, she should be, then he would be accused under Roman law of incitement to murder since capital jurisdiction was withheld from the Jewish authorities. They couldn't condemn somebody to die. That was the Romans' job. So if Jesus said this, so they're trying to trap Jesus. (laughs) They're trying to trap Jesus. Regardless of this case, this woman is as, as good as dead Physically, her, her reputation. I don't know if she had kids or not. What are they going to think? You know, whatever. whatever. It, it's, it's just this ugly, dead, slaving moment for this woman in, in all around. Verse 6. They're trying to trap Jesus into saying something that they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and he said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down again and wrote in the dirt. <laughs> How about that? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that, isn't that fascinating? The, the, the zeal of these guys, they want to get this woman. And they really, 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 really want to get Jesus. They want to trap Jesus and to prove how righteous they themselves were. And then Jesus, and I love this about Jesus. Sometimes you think of him as some like guy with a sour face and never, you know, just never cracks a smile. You got to, you got to get it. You got to read your Bible some more. Okay. And he does this thing. He does things on his own timetable and his own methods. And so he just kind of ignores them, I guess, at first. And he's just writing in the dirt. Some people like, some, you know, scholars look at this and they're like, well, perhaps he was listing the sins of everybody else in that group. Okay, there's Amy and blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, some people think that. Some people think that he was just uh, um, writing different laws. I don't know. I don't know that it really matters a whole lot. But I know that the hands that bore nails in them kind of take this moment to relieve the situation and to calm down (laughs) and to just have this moment. These guys, though, they're persistent. They keep demanding an an answer. Man, what, what about that? What got into them so badly that I need an answer now? I need an answer. This woman, man, have you been there? Have you been there? Little by little, they're being exposed. Their anger, their jealousy toward Jesus, their hatred, their unbelief in Jesus itself. It's revealing itself very quickly here. Listen to this. Rule keeping, like these guys did. They, they, they were probably pretty good at keeping the, the, the laws, the Moses' law, what the people lived under. Rule keeping that is not kept in check by humility and grace is always going to lead to anarchy. All right? So the very thing that they're trying to do, to keep these rules, do everything exactly right, then God has to love me and do everything that I ask him to do. When we get to that point, you better watch it. Yeah, God calls us to live pure and holy. Yes, he does. His law is for all time. The Old Testament Testament law, you know, I love the Lord your God, all all these kinds of things. This is God's standards. This is God's standards. But whenever we start saying like, yeah, I, I, okay, yeah, I, I'm doing this. I'm not killing. I'm not murdering. I'm, I'm having a Bible study every day or whatever the case may be. If that begins to do those things, but if that begins to cause you to have such pride and arrogance in your heart that you cannot see people, you got a problem. You've missed the whole message of the law and of the scriptures. You have missed it. You've missed it. Just like these these men have. 
They keep demanding this answer. So Jesus says this. The scripture says this. So he stood up again and he said, all right, you, you can stone her. Go ahead. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Man, you know, when I hear that sometimes, it makes me want to stand up and say like, yeah, take that. Yeah. See? All right? Go for it. <laughs> but but I got to guard my heart. I got to guard my heart, you know, because I'll be just like those guys too. And you will too, if we're not careful. All right? Jesus can say this because he's the only sinless one who could really cast that first stone if he wanted to. These, these guys didn't have the right to. You and I don't have that right to. I wonder what this woman was thinking at this point in time. You did, that all of a sudden, this tide is kind of changing. She's, she, she comes in on this wave of like, she may not even survive in the next few minutes because this riotous crowd with big rocks is there ready to kill her. She doesn't know if she's going to survive in the next 10 to 20 minutes or an hour, whatever the case may be. And then all of a sudden, this, this, this Jewish man, this teacher, this rabbi, this son of God pauses the moment and it puts, flips it on its head. Whoever hasn't sinned first, go for it. Joe has said this over the past several weeks, what God has done for so many, he'll do for you. This woman kind of bleeds off into anonymity. We don't know much more about her after this story. I, I don't, we don't know her name. We don't know much about her. But God did, and he knows you, and he knows your name, and he knows when you've been caught he knows when you need to be caught. But he also sometimes says time out and extends some grace. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with this woman. Have you ever thought, what if, what if I have this moment to just sit down with Jesus, toe to toe, knee to knee, eyeball to eyeball, what would he say? And I don't know about you, but sometimes I have these moments <laughs> I'm afraid of what he's going to say. Mike, you know better. What's the matter with you? Good luck. What would he say to you? Look at what he says to this woman. And Jesus stood up again and he said to this woman, where are your accusers? Look around. Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Neither do I. Neither do I. Go and sin no more. So this woman stands in front of Jesus, trapped, humiliated, used, enslaved to her own sins, enslaved by everybody else's sins over here, trying to make a point with her life and her mistakes and her sin, potentially facing death today after this moment of passion earlier. She meets Jesus with all that she is and nothing to hold back. I mean, it's all there, literally and figuratively, laid right before Jesus. And look at Jesus, how Jesus responds to her. He gives her grace. He resurrects her in a way that maybe she never realized. She now has life again. 
she's been dead. She's been enslaved by all her mess and everybody else's mess on top of her mess. And now she's let go and now she's free. The only one who could free her, freed her. John 3, 17, after John 3, 16, for, you know, for God so loved the world, etc. For John, John 3, 17 says, as God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Did you catch that? Not, not to judge them. That doesn't mean that that doesn't matter, but that's not Jesus's job. Jesus was sent by God to mankind, to you and to me to save us. Sometimes we need to be caught. Sometimes we need to be caught. I don't know what this woman's story finishes out as. I don't know. I'd like to think that she was one of his biggest supporters and followers after this moment. How could she not? I don't know. We don't know. But what if she hadn't gotten caught? (laughs) To kind of take the story in a weird direction. What if she hadn't gotten caught? Maybe she needed this moment to come face to face with real forgiveness and grace and new life. He specializes in that. Jesus knew she was guilty of sin. He tells her, go and sin no more. He knows, he knows. He didn't need a crowd of riotous people, but he forgives her. And in a metaphorical sense, he gives her life again. He gives her freedom. She once was enslaved, but Jesus gives her the keys to unlock the shackles that are binding her. And that, those keys are grace, grace from him. And some of you, listen, some of you come here because you know that deep down inside, you're dead too. Maybe you come and you know that you're enslaved. And you're just trying to figure out, I, I, I got to do something. Maybe some of you come here today and you're dragging everybody else along and you're blind to your own mess. You're enslaved too. <laughs> you're in sin too. You're enslaved in, 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 as well. And Jesus knows. <laughs> Jesus knows that. But maybe you need to be caught. Maybe you need to be caught. Maybe you're here today and you've been used. You've been abused. Now you're confused. And Jesus maybe says to you, toe to toe, knee to knee, eyeball to eyeball, where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Maybe you have some sin that just you continue to struggle with over and over and over again, and it causes you to keep your head down in shame before God. And yeah, you might come here week after week, and you just put your head down, and you're serving, you're doing a lot of things, you're doing some things during the week, but you just can't look up to heaven because you know you've got this sin that just keeps at you over and over and over again, and you think to yourself, it's just going to be any minute now. It's going to be any minute now. God's going God's to smite me. And you can't look up to heaven. And you're in this mess. And Satan's got you right where he wants you. He's got you enslaved to this mess. But maybe if you're to sit toe to toe, knee to knee, eyeball to eyeball, maybe Jesus would say to you, where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus freely gives her his grace, right? He freely gives her his grace. But there's also this expectation to not walk back into that sense of slavery, all right? This isn't a license to just, God loves everybody. He doesn't care, do whatever you want. No, 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 no. No, don't believe what the world's telling you. Jesus is very aware of sin. (laughs) Go and don't do this again, is what he says. Here's the, here's the thing. There, there's got to be repentance and transformation too. Or, or else maybe you haven't really connected that with God yet. The grace and beauty of being caught is that sometimes, the, the, listen to this, the grace and beauty of being caught is that we can be transformed too. That's the beauty of it. And some of you need to be caught. We must come face to face with the reality of my sin 
It's an affront to God. My sin is an affront to God. It's like me flipping off God with my life. It's an affront. Don't compare yourself to Hitler who's murdering thousands of people. Compare yourself to the righteous Jesus who's holy and pure and demands that of us, but also understands we live in this flesh and we have a sin nature and we need help. And we, we need help. That my sin, but if I cannot come face to face with my sin, if I'm busy dragging people over and saying, look at him, God, I'm messed up. I'm the one messed up. I'm the one with problems. When we come to grips with the truth that I'm a sinner, I am a sinner, there can be healing and there can be forgiveness and there can be change. Later on in John 8, verse 31, Jesus says this, says it, or it says this, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you're truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. Jesus expects some things of us, only fair. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Quit hiding. Quit hiding from your sin. And these people, uh, they're, they're, they're religious people for the most part. It says this, verse 33, but, but we're descendants of Abraham. They said, we've never been slaves to any, anyone. What do you mean you'll be set free? They're using their family heritage as like, God, we're good. You, you know, my, my grandparents, my ancestors, they were good church going people and everything. Abraham, hey, the father of faith, you know, we're, we're pretty awesome here. And Jesus says, no, no, no. <laughs> Jesus replied, I tell you the truth that everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave's not a permanent member of the family, though. Remember that. If you're stuck in a sin, you're not a permanent member of the family, but a son is a part of that family forever. And if the son sets you free, you're truly free. Has he set you free? Have you taken that? Have you held up your, your, your arms to him with the shackles around it and said, you got to take this. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a mess. I'm a slave to this and I don't know what to do and give it to him. And seeing the truth of the fact that I'm a sinner, I'm a mess, I'm judgmental, I have anger issues, fill in the blanks. But when the son sets you free, you're really free. Sometimes it's better to be caught than to be condemned. We want to We'll hide, we'll lie, we'll justify our sin, but sometimes we just need to be caught so that it won't happen again. Maybe you need to be caught with your business practices. Maybe you need to be caught with your porn addiction. Maybe you need to be caught in your gossip. We're given forgiveness through the blood of Jesus, taking the punishment that we deserve. But there is an expectation to go and sin no more. It's not an excuse for this lady to return back to the old life, but it's an opportunity for her to come alive again and to be free, to be resurrected from death to life. Romans 6, 1 through 7 says this. Paul, this is Paul. This is somebody whose life was drastically changed by Jesus in a huge way. And he says this, well then, should we keep on sinning? So that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace. Because this is all nice. This is great. You know, God, Jesus forgives. That, that's great. But Paul says, you know, do we keep doing this and sinning so that we can, God can keep showing his grace? Of course not. Paul says, of course not. Why would we do that? He said, since we've died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Jesus Christ in baptism, we joined Jesus in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Some of you, your next step, because you're a slave to sin, you haven't died to it yet. You haven't said, I, I'm done and repented and been baptized. You've not taken that step for whatever reason. 
and, and this is this picture, of, I'm pointing it up here at the baptistry, back beyond there is a bunch of water in this, this tank, right? Nothing special about the water. It in and of itself is not holy, but it's a picture of God doing this amazing thing in us and us going down there and boom, I'm dying. I'm dying to that old mic. I'm dying to that old way of being a slave to the mess. But I'm also, I'm not being left in that water. I'm pulled back up again. I'm reborn. Not because anything that I've done, I put my faith in Jesus Christ who took my punishment. And when he, when he comes in me, when I receive that, when I, when I say, I need your forgiveness, and I am baptized and God's spirit comes in, in me and cleans me up and pushes me forward towards him and takes these shackles off. Some of you, your next step is to be baptized. Here's the problem. Um, I grew up and I had a pet goldfish. <laughs> Um, I don't know if any of you guys have ever had a, a pet goldfish before, but imagine this. You know, you got this goldfish that's just kind of living there, and it's looking out at the world, and it's like, man, I, I'd really love to be out there again. That looks so enticing and so amazing. And so if we were to dip our hand in there, grab that fish, put it out there, it's going to die, <laughs> Right? It was not made to live there. It is not made to live outside of that tank. And some of us, we look at, even Christians included, we look around at, at life and everything. We're like, man, I want to do all that stuff. All right, God has all these rules and everything. I want to do all that stuff. Problem is, you weren't made to live that way. You were made to live in freedom and holiness by the grace and power of Jesus Christ. And so just in closing today, my question for you is this. Who, who are you in this story? Who are you? Are, are, are you like this woman who's caught in the act? Sin has finally caught up with you? Are you hiding things from people all along, but now they really know who you are? Who are you in this story? Or are you these uh, religious guys, the, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees? They're trying, to, trying hard to be good and to do right, but it spiraled out of control, and now you're just kind of a jerk. You're just me. You become more holy. You've enjoyed hearing praise from everybody else around you who thinks so highly of you, and you're enjoying that. You enjoy the acknowledgement of how good you are to where slowly over time you can't begin to understand how somebody like this woman could do certain things. You become someone pointing a finger at others instead of holding a hand out to help them up. Who are you in this story? Randy, in the jailhouse in Missouri, he got caught. He got caught. Embarrassing all over the news. Questions about his business practices now at this point in time. But Sunday morning, after he got arrested and everything, about Tuesday or so, he was able to get out and, uh, for a time. He comes Sunday morning into our little church, and he walked down to the front, and he just, and the preacher let him say a few words, and he just said, hey, said his name, I think you know a little bit about me now. <laughs> and he just basically said this, I've been caught, and I need help. And I've never been more free in my life when he faced the fact that he was a sinner and he needed help and he exposed it. Maybe you need to be caught and not condemned. Let's pray. God, we uh, thank you for Jesus. God, maybe we're the woman caught in the act. God, I, I pray if that's us, Lord God, would you... Bring healing to us and forgiveness. We need you. Bring us whole again, we pray. And Father, if we're the ones pointing the fingers and picking up stones, Lord God, I pray that we would drop those stones. Lord God, God, speak to our hearts. Change us. Make us like you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.